Kirsten for us. Great. Uh, it's great to, uh, to introduce Richard. Uh, I'm sure most of you are already familiar with him. Um, Richard, uh, originally from US, did undergraduate in US and then moved and did his master degree in the University of Toronto and PhD in Ottawa. Uh, at that point, he already started uh, to, to be interested in the topics he follows uh, up to now in paleomagnetic reconstructions in large igneous provinces and um, also in planetary geology. Uh, he continued with a postdoc at Geological Survey of Canada and after that he managed to leave on soft money uh, sort of from consortium of uh, uh, a number of companies that funded academical work um, sort of trying to date large igneous provinces all over the world. And that's where uh, Richard's ability to organize and kind of bring together scientists from uh, anywhere in the world uh, sort of flourished. And um, uh, he has a unique ability to kind of combine people and bring to one goal to, uh, to reconstruct uh, uh, ages of large igneous provinces and eventually to use them uh, for, uh, for paleogeographical reconstructions. And in the last few years, Richard was very interested in uh, effects of large igneous provinces on climate, on extinctions, and on our environmental changes. So with this, I pass it to Richard. Uh, Richard, you might need to unmute yourself, right? Yeah, Richard, you're still muted. For some reason, oh, I see. So I'm unmuted now, right? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. So we'll, we'll do the same thing again. Sorry about this. Uh, let's see. Share, share, share. share. So sorry. Sharing you. Uh, slide show from the beginning. And then I have to convert to the other thing here. Let's find that. You guys can still hear me, right? Yep. Where is, okay. To find the, uh, where is the, I can't get the, uh, we had this working before. Now, why yeah. can't I, I can't see the, ah, there it is. Okay, there, there it is. Got it now. Okay. Display no settings, swap view. There we go. We're good now, right? Yeah, it looks good. Yay. Okay, yeah. thanks everybody. And thanks, Andre, for the introduction. It's been a, a great journey. And one of the neat things about this journey on initially dike swarms and then more broadly into large igneous provinces and then into every aspect of, of their relevance to uh, continental breakup. And then more recently with respect to um, um, con environmental changes has been the great, uh, the wonderful, incredible group of colleagues I've had the chance to work with over the years. So kudos, I just, it's been a thrill. So let me take you on a, a, a it's a huge topic. It's become a huge topic uh, and so I want to present, uh, share a lot with you today. I want to focus on things related to an overview of the Precambrian Lips record, which has been, which is now much more robust than even 10 years ago, and the role in climate change, defining natural time boundaries in the Precambrian, uh, plumes and continental breakup, and then a little bit on resource exploration. So um, just to start, um, as we all know, the Lips are huge volume, mainly mafic events, that can be in place often in a very short time period. The uh, high precision uranium lead dating is often showing that many are in place, the, the bulk of the magnetism in about a million years or so. And in interplate setting, the, uh, they're at least 100,000 cubic kilometers, but they can be up to nearly 80 million cubic kilometers if one takes the Antang Java Oceanic Plateau plus Manihiki plus Hikarangi Plateaus, which are all reconstructed together. Siberian Traps is also large. You can see my cursor, right? Is it okay? Uh, sorry, I think so. Move it around again. I'm going to make it a fuzzball there. Now you oh, should there. see it, right? Yes. Yeah. 
So the Siberian Traps is also large. The Can is also large, and there are lots of others. And I'll give you a tour, uh, a brief tour of the record through time. Just in terms of scale, I like to often mention the size of these things that for, say, Canada, the US, or China, uh, the largest or the smallest versus the largest could cover the entirety of Canada to 10 meters and up to, um, for Antang Java case, up to nearly eight kilometers. So these are huge volume events in a short period of time and, and drive a lot of the Earth system in a complementary role with respect to plate tectonic system. Um, in terms of their components, we talk about the flood basalt components, and then they're also their plumbing system of dikes, sills, layered intrusions, and the magmatic underplate at the base of the crust. And I'm going to be talking mostly about them in the context of being linked with mantle plumes, but I know there's lots of, there are alternative models, and we can certainly discuss the pros and cons and the applicability of some of those alternative models later. In terms of the record, um, <coughs> The, we just had a new uh, special AGU volume uh, published uh, with myself, um, Dixon, and uh, Andre Becker as co-editors. And first chapter was providing an updated review of the global lift record through time. I've got the first two time slices here, 0 to 500 and 500 to 1,000 million years. And in color coding, different kinds of things, continental lips in, in dark outlines, oceanic lips in blue accreted oceanic lips in purple, and then this associated aspect called silicic large igneous provinces in orange. And you can see the various features here, and there are a lot of events, and some you'll recognize, many you'll recognize. As you go back in time, the number and the sizes tend to get smaller because of lips, um, the flood basalt component having been removed by erosion, so we have to reconstruct the original extent of these by dating uh, or paleomagnetic or geochemical correlation of the scattered intrusive components, you know, dikes and sills to recognize the original extent. Plus also that many of these lips have been broken by um, subsequent plate breakup, supercontinent breakup. And so we've got fragments that are distributed on different blocks, but we fully expect as we go, as we develop the record, correct for reconstructions, uh, do enough dating to understand the full extent on each block of a given lip that we're going to see distributions and scale of events comparable to what we see in the, the last 500 million years. And I'm just going to step through and not really go into any particular details at this moment, moment on the specific um, events, but you can see that there are a lot of different events. Uh, some are quite small at this point, but we certainly suspect that, as I mentioned, that they're going to be quite large as we uh, continue to discover their extent. I just make one point here, something like the Siberian trap event up here was only known mainly from the Craton a few years ago, up to about 10, 15 years ago. And, and that's only 250 million years old. And yet more recently, starting about 2009, dating in the West Siberian basin essentially indicated that the Siberian trap event continued into the West Siberian basin and even into the Ural Mountains. So even events as, as young as 250 million years, virtually doubled in size uh, in the last 10 million years. So this is a moving target in terms of the number of events and also their scales. Here's a record from 1,000 to 1,500. I'll just mention a couple of them, the, the McKenzie event up here, which is one that many of us will be familiar with, and I'll mention more explicitly the Umkondo event here at 1,100 uh, and a number of other events. Here in the 1,500 to 2,000, you can see uh, things like the Circum Superior event here uh, and many, many others. So there's a lot of different events here um, uh, and it's a wealth of information for us to be building up. Finally, I wanna go back to the 2000 to um, 2500 and you see a number of different events. I'll mention things like the Bushveld event here. And of course there's other Bushveld equivalents in other blocks and we'll talk about those a little bit later. Bushveld being particularly important as a, large, um, as a large igneous province on its own with the huge, um, the huge Bushveld complex intrusion and also its links with ore deposits. So I'll mention that a little bit more later. And then you go back to the Archean and we have a much more scattered record, um, but we're getting increasing success in starting to uh, identify separate lips and correlate them and uh, through reconstructions. So we've made a lot of progress over the last years, but there's huge amounts of opportunity to go forward. Before I get into some of the thematic things, 
um, with respect to climate, with respect to continental breakup, and with respect to ore deposits. I'm just going to go a little bit about the plumbing system aspects. And one, so this is uh, something we did a few years ago, looking at from a mantle plume perspective, generation of partial melts, accumulation at the base of the crust, crust as a magnetic underplate, and then magma coming up into the crust, both producing dikes and sills, um, and the dike swarm, and then producing um, flood basalts at the surface, sill provinces as well, and integrating that all in an ocean probably in, 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 in a big way connecting all of that in this plan view you see both radiating dike swarms that can extend out you know over 2,000 kilometers and also this new discovery of giant circumferential swarms. Uh, this is something that Ken Bucken and myself have been working on, on over the past few years and I'll say a little bit more about that as we go forward. Okay the next thing uh, just is to look at one aspect of the intrusions so if you're looking in here, you see that in all these purple things represent associated intrusions. And they're things like a sill-like layered intrusion, which might be like a bushveld, a dike-like layered intrusion, which might like be like a great dike of Zimbabwe, sills here, and then scattered intrusions associated with the dike swarms. And notice this sort of center region here with a circumferential set of intrusions. The inspiration for this comes from the Mackenzie Swarm, an original paper by Bob Berger at all 1996, noted this ring of gravity anomalies circumscribing the Mackenzie Plume Center. The Mackenzie Swarm, you know, is, is the, the, the most impressive, one of the most impressive swarms originally characterized by Walter Ferry uh, and summarized in a paper in 1987, radiates over 100 degrees, extends out over 2300 kilometers. We probably have continuation of it into Southern Siberia. Um, I'll mention that. And also we can see continuation of it over into the Yukon, into some of the exposed basement inliers. So it certainly does extend under this portion here, which is younger cover. And in the very well-defined plume center region, we've got a bunch of layered intrusions defined on the basis of gravity. They, you can barely see the contours here representing the gravity anomalies. And then there are so some are associated with aeromagnetic anomalies. And then there's an overall aeromagnetic anomaly here that along with some seismic information suggests this is the distribution of the uh, magmatic underplate. I wanna focus on this area then. So this is, this is kind of our indication of potential layered intrusions ringing the plume center at a distance of 100 or 200 kilometers away and then potentially being feeders for subswarms of dikes. That's the original model from Berger et al. 1996, and then developed further in Blanchard et al. 2017. Interestingly, they, you know, the, the muskox intrusion then is downstream from one of these anomalies and can be linked to it. And so there's potential for trying to look for other mus muskox type things outboard from some of these gravity anomalies. So we're really interested in looking and seeing whether there's such uh, gravity anomalies to be found um, uh, around other centers. It's proved difficult because the plume center regions tend to be deformed during a subsequent ocean closure. Many lips are associated with ocean opening and then you can have ocean closure that kind of messes everything up in the plume center region. So we've had a hard time finding other analogs. Uh, just recently, um, uh, I wanna mention, uh, talk, uh, um, Chinese colleagues uh, have been studying the Tarim large igneous province. This is about 29, uh, 290 to 270 million years in the Tarim Freitan. And this uh, gray shading here, gray shading here represents the outline of some of the volcanism. And then they noticed as well from detailed seismics, et cetera, that there were distinct domes located here. And one plausible interpretation for those domes is that they're uplifted due to um, the presence of, of um, intrusions. And so the, um, the, this, there's a hint here then that if, if this interpretation of deeply buried intrusions that have caused the size, caused the local uplift here of this intrusions is correct, then we potentially have intrusions that are also somewhat circumscribing a plume center um, at a distance of 100 or 200 kilometers. So uh, we're looking for more examples of that, but that's something we're, we're kind of keen to explore. Uh, so now I just want to sort of give you the outline for the rest of the talk. Um, this shows you the global barcode. So there's a lot of events. And they happen uh, if you can combine both the well-preserved continental record 
and the ocean and the rate in the oceanic record for the last 200 million years, you can infer an overall rate through time of about one to every 15 million years or so. So it's a pretty intense um, uh, um, frequency of events. Some names of some events are mentioned here. And um, one of the things I should note, this I haven't updated this in a while, so there are some apparent gaps here, but those gaps have been shrinking. We tend to be finding events as we continue to date that are filling in the gaps. What I wanna do with this record is look at, uh, first of all, a little bit, just briefly about the ore deposits aspect, and then spend a little more on rifting and breakup or attempted breakup and the role of recognized mantle plumes. And then I will spend most of the rest of the talk looking at the link with dramatic climate change and mass extinction events. And really the interesting potential of using the LIP record because of its effect on, on the uh, atmospheric and oceanic climate as potential proxies for natural time boundaries in the Precambrian. Throughout, in a couple places, I'm also going to mention this extremely fun topic of planetary analogs. We have a big mapping program or big mapping group, um, international group that's mapping detailed areas of Venus to try and, um, because Venus doesn't have plate tectonics and the, or at the present time. And so the volcanism, the characteristics are all interplayed and there's lots of comparative aspects relevant to lips on earth. So I'll intersperse some interesting stuff from that. So a little bit about the ore deposit stuff in the first place. As Andre mentioned, um, we've had great support from the mining industry and the oil, and the oil industry over the years, um, particularly since 2010, uh, a large amount of support. Um, there was an initial grant and this uh, for a project that was co-led by myself and Dr. Bleeker. And then we had continued projects um, in 2000, so 2010 to 2016, 2016, 2017. And the current project here is, uh, uh, is described here. These are the current companies. And then this list shows the, all the companies that have been part of our projects since the beginning, about 12 different companies. So then with that support of something like uh, uh, well over 3, 000, 3 million Canadian, uh, and then all sorts of associated collaborative uh, research through Russian, Swedish, Zimbabwe, Chinese, and USA grants. That's enabled us to, to do a lot of uranium-led geochronology, which led to our current um, in kind of impressive um, understanding, recognition of many new lips. We've probably doubled the number of lips uh, in the last 10 years. Uh, just briefly, a nod to the current team um, and uh, others who I should list as well, uh, Nasser Yubi, who's on here, also should be listed here. And there's a number of other people whose names you'll recognize, so we have a broad international team, both for geochronology, paleomagnetism and reconstruction, geochemistry and ore deposits, and so on. Just briefly, I'm just going to touch the topic here, and just to say that many of the large igneous, many large ore deposits, that one could call tier one deposits, are associated with LIPS. Nickel laterites in the Car Caribbean associated with the 90 million year old Columbia Caribbean lip. Norilsk, of course, the famous uh, nickel for um, PGE sulfide occurrence in Siberia, uh, major supplier, 70% of the world's uh, palladium, for instance, and things like that, part of the Siberian trap event. Myrrh and tau gold in Central Asia seems to be at least age correlated with the Tarim, the proximal Tarim lip. Siberian diamonds, the Yakutsk Valui lip of Siberia, uh, which is comparable to the scale of the Siberian trap event, but about 120 million years older, is the source, is linked to all the diamondiferous or most of the diamondiferous kimberlites in Siberia. Sullivan set X in Western Laurentia, uh, linked to the 1470 million year old Moy Purcell. Olympic Dam, the, the massive iron oxide copper gold deposits in South Australia is part of the 15, 90 million year old Gala range lip. The Palabora carbonatite with its copper ores and others uh, is part of the Bushveld lip. Hammersley iron formation is in part correlated with uh, the, this Wungora Willy Willy event uh, of the Southern Yilgarn. And then uh, just with specifically with magmatic sulfides because that's where the star strongest link is, Nerils with Siberian traps, Bushveld of course with its um, magmatic sulfides, Jin Chuan, potentially part of a, a lip. Thompson and Chakotut, Raglan are all part of the circumsuperior lip. Muscox part of the Mackenzie lip. Many of these uh, channelists that people are interested in and other intrusions uh, in the 
mid-continent region, part of the Keweenawan Lip. Uh, they're all, they're like Duluth, Eagle, Tamarack, and et cetera. Maxut and Kalatonga, which are in Central Asia, are part of the Tarim Lip. Freetown intrusion in um, Ivory Coast is part of the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province, has some uh, PGE potential. East Bull Lake in Southern Ontario is part of the Metachuan Lip. It's not just magmatic sulfides, there are also uh, hydrothermal ores that seem to be related to the intense thermal pulse that comes from large igneous provinces. Um, more about that in a moment, but in the Siberian Trap event, which is here and also in the West Siberian Basin, also into adjacent Ural Mountains, has a magmatic sulfides of the Talnak and Norilsk area, but also has a whole suite of hydrothermal ore deposits both here and up in the Yenisei region here, the Taimir Peninsula, that are all part, uh, that are all approximately coleval in age and in some way related. So uh, Simon Jowett and I put together kind of a, a five-part uh, lip, lip resource exploration classification where lips are the primary source of the commodities. So that would be the nickel, copper, PGE, or chrome, or titanium, iron, vanadium kind of deposits, which are directly associated with the magnetism of lips. Niobium and tantalum is linked to associated carbonatites, and of course, diamonds linked to associated kimberlites. The other aspect, another aspect is where lips are providing the energy and fluids to drive hydrothermal systems. And thus, that's for ore deposits. There's also an aspect related to um, hydrocarbons where lips such as in West Africa, Morocco, Algeria can be affecting the maturity or over maturity of those, um, those hydro of hydrocarbon occurrences due to the thermal pulse at 200 million years. Lip rocks, particularly sills and dikes, can act as barriers for fluid flow and the reaction zones to cause precipitation out of valuable metals, such as the Golden Mile Dolerite event, or part of or the event in the Yilgarn, which is gold rich and fluids going through this uh, late Archean intrusions. These intrusions, part of a lip, um, precipitated out gold. From a hydrocarbon perspective, they can be structural traps for hydrocarbons, and from an oil, or a water aquifer perspective, such as in South Africa or in um, uh, um, India, they can, the uh, sills and dikes associated with um, lips can be acting as constraining the aquifer flow. Then the surface processes, weathering of lip rocks to produce laterites. So uh, many um, camp and other central Atlantic magmatic province and other, and the Deccan weathering in, in tropical areas uh, concentrates aluminum and nickel and leads to uh, laterites. And then from the um, uh, hydrocarbon perspective, lips have a strong correlation with oceanic anoxia. And so those can be, um, uh, and so those are good source rocks for hydrocarbons. And then there's an indirect link. We, we've, we find that using lips for reconstructions is really efficient. We'll mention that briefly. Uh, and so uh, they help us in uh, reconstructions and therefore tracing of metallogenic belts from one block to another. There's another aspect here that's a little more subtle. I'll just briefly mention is the idea that as we go back in time, um, we can use lips as a proxy for times of attempted or successful breakup. And when you have ocean breakup that's in a plate tectonic circuit that is going to lead to transpression or compression somewhere else on the planet. And so if you're looking at orogenic deposits, it's probably going to be useful to kind of to compare the record of orogenic uh, gold, for instance, with uh, this record of lip breakup, where there are some interesting correlations, but it's an aspect that we need to consider more fully. All right. I, I know I'm kind of racing along here, but I did want to give you a kind of a snapshot of where of what we're what, we're, what the field is looking like these days. Um, so next thing is going to be looking at links with rifting and breakup or attempted breakup and the role of plume centers. Uh, back in 1997, Story and Kyle and others have been looked at the distribution of plume centers identified for all the lip events that were associated with the progressive breakup of Gondwana. And then also the initial Central Atlantic Magmatic Province plume center, which is associated with the break off of Laurentia um, from, so here's the, here's the breakup at 200 to create the uh, Atlantic Ocean. 
And then these are all the subsequent breakups that sequentially break up um, Gondwana. And then here's a diagram from Valter Bleeker and I, where we were looking at the superior craton and seeing a number of radiating dike swarms converging on the margins, indicating the location of plume centers at those times. And then some speculations at the time as to which blocks were conjugate at the time and which had broken away in order to, um, um, had broken away, which is, and so more about that in a moment. Um, one of the key things then is these plume centers. And so far we've got about 100 plume centers currently recognized. And many of those have been recognized on the basis of, of um, radiating dike swarms. And our context, our experience is suggesting a, to us that every new ocean, every major new ocean opening requires both favorable plate stresses and a mantle plume as, as evidenced by a radiating dike swarm. So the other, the other aspect of it, there are some lips such as Kiwanawan and the Siberian traps of lips that are associated with failed opening because they lacked, would seem they had the red mantle plume but lacked the favorable plate stresses. Just to kind of briefly mention it here, here in this particular case, 20 to 30 million years prior to the opening of the Atlantic Ocean at 195, there was precursor rifting all the way along the coast here associated with the Newark, base, Newark Basin, suggesting that this overall crust was in tension at the time and the plume arrival was the additional input necessary, uplift and, and, and necessary plume spreading necessary to finish the breakup, the cause breakup. And so favorable plate stresses and then associated plume, we would suggest is part of the formula for new major oceans. I just wanna go back then look at our record, a little bit of our rec this record of large of mantle plumes and, and seeing what it's tell us, telling us about um, breakups. Uh, so in this particular slide from our, from a, our paper from a few years ago, uh, you see the, the Franklin event of Northern Canada, which is a really impressive radiating swarm and uh, volcanics and sills, part of the 720 million year old event and associated magnetism in the Minto Inlier and the conjugate activity that more recently recognized in Southern Siberia with two dike swarms converging, other dikes probably buried under younger cover here in between, don't know yet. And then all these different layered intrusions that have been dated of similar age, Tartai, Upper Kingosh, Tavorin. And so putting them into this particular reconstruction. It is also possible that 1270, we have the Mackenzie swarm here, and then there's this major 300 meter wide dike here that, I've, um, that has both a mafic and ultramafic components and seems to me somewhat analogous to the Muscox intrusion in terms of Muscox intrusion feeder dike. So I'm look, we're trying to learn more about this. This is slightly younger at 1260, so maybe 10 million years younger. And then we have other events at, events at 1350, at 1750 with potential plume centers and a major dike swarm here at 1870. Is it at all related to the ghost event of the slave craton? We don't know yet. So, and I just mentioned, I'm uh, advocating this tight fit between Siberia and Laurentia here. Sergei Pizarevsky on the basis of his paleomagnetic interpretation typically assumes a, a looser fit between Siberia and Laurentia and, and, and room for another block. All right, just some other things here. So um, one of the major events is at 1100 million years, uh, both in the uh, Kalahari Craton and also Bundokun Craton and uh, Amazonia and elsewhere. And so um, starting here, for instance, a number of ages published in a paper by Dukak et al. 2014, we recognized sort of dominant mantle plume center and then other centers here with some multiple directions of rifting or dikes parallel and perpendicular. And then subsequently in a paper with Ken Buck and we interpret these dikes here to be part of a circumferential swarm. More about that in a few minutes. Taking that sort of story and taking this as the main plume center in this Chowdhury et al. publication in pre-came research, uh, we developed um, the idea of Umkandia. So with the radiating swarm from the Catfell and then with respect to the Congo, Craton, the Bundokan Craton and Amazonia developing a bit of a radiating swarm and using that plus the available paleomag to suggest a Umkandia block. So a lot of this stuff is sort of still being sorted out but we think that the large igneous province and particularly this aspect related to plumes 
is providing a whole bunch of new kind of constraints that are really useful. Here's something that really worked out remarkably well, working with Xuanhong Zhang um, on the North China Craton, where this is an enigmatic, enigmatic 13, 20 million year old major sill province in a, in a sedimentary basin about 400 kilometers long. And this Yan Lao lip here um, has this unique age. It's also associated now, we know, with the Bayanova carbonatite, which is one of the richest carbonatites in the world. And it's part of this 1320 event. This 1320 event is rare globally. And the only other place with it that we recognized was in um, Northern Australia, in the North Australia craton. And the North Australia craton has this beautiful radiating swarm that's now been dated. And it's also about 1320. So it's so plume center here, very well defined plume center. And then with respect, and then it belongs with respect to the North China craton. There is a one big dike we have so far in the North China Craton, and we can converge that towards this uh, this Der this Galawinko Center plume center here, and um, Paleomag does support this as well. So uh, this one lip provided the essential constraints for linking North China Craton and North Australia Craton, and the associated um, sedimentary basins, the Shamaling Formation and the MacArthur Formations, both of which have hydrocarbon potential, et cetera. So it's a, it's a, it's a, that was a big success story, partly because this is such a unique lip age globally. Just another few examples here. 1890 is an uh, interesting time. This was by um, Camille Stark and others uh, in 2019, looking at uh, new data from the Yilgarn matching with available 1890 from the Bastar and the Darwar cratons and inferring a potential plume center in this sort of configuration or in this configuration. Um, this would require probably a separate block inside there. Again, an interesting thing in 1890. Also, uh, Cedric Jukcho did uh, publish recently in geology, looking at this impressive superior, circumsuperior lip. Let me look at the circumsuperior lip first over here, where you have, these are uh, the Thompson nickel belt and the Raglan deposits here, both important nickel uh, occurrences. But this magmatic event circumscribes the uh, Labrador Trough and also is present in the southern, um, south of Lake Superior. And so it's an impressive event uh, and has carbonatites that are associated. And then also with this pickle crow dike dated, developed a giant radiating swarm here, suggesting a plume center here, maybe a secondary plume center here on the basis of the, mag the, the high MG basalts here and so on. And so one option is that the, there was a plume coming up underneath the superior craton. Um, this side, by the way, has to be rotated back about 20 degrees based on a rotation across the, the um, along the capital spacing zone. Uh, and the idea of a plume coming up underneath, producing some of the carbonatites and then portions of the plume sliding upward and outward to thin spots on the edge of the craton could explain a main plume center here and additional potential plume centers here and here. The work by uh, Cedric Jukcho and his colleagues pushed this a bit further and said, the, so what could be attached south here is the Kalahari Craton. And you can have um, then this impressive black range swarm that's present in here, plus some, um, uh, the, uh, the other dikes of 1880 age up in, in um, Northern Zimbabwe and all being distal parts of the circum superior lip. An interesting possibility and worth exploring more. Nico Kastek looking in the uh, northern or eastern portion of the slave cra or the um, superior craton, the Minto Pavangnatut lip, uh, and other lips here. You see the circles locating different plume centers based on lips. And in this particular reconstruction here, you can see the North Atlantic craton being juxtaposed with matching uh, plume centers and from radiating swarms. So I just wanted to give you a kind of a quick tour of that and just say that there are a lot of large, a lot of lips on Earth, a lot of plume centers, at least a hundred so far. And I just wanted to jump to Venus briefly. Venus has no plate tectonics, but it has lots of um, probable plume centers and uh, many of those associated with radiating dike swarms. This is from a survey done on Venus in a sinusoidal projection back in 19, uh, 1994. And so, uh, and you see about, I think it was 60 or 70 different plume centers here. 
more detailed mapping that we did in this region here identified a whole bunch of additional plume centers here, many of associated with volcanic edifices, et cetera. You know, many times, maybe five times as many. So one takes any region like this and continues to map it in detail. And so the global inventory of plume centers on Venus is likely to be very comparable to what we see on Earth. Another aspect is these circumferential dike swarms. So here in the Lake Victoria area, you see this intense or circular dike swarm, 600 kilometers across, probably continues over here, but we don't have the data. Here's another example, and it's part of the Panuni Kambaran lip of the Congo Craton. Here in the high Arctic, work with Ken Buck and identifying both the radiating dike swarm and a circumferential dike swarm, some 1,700 kilometers across, um, with slightly offset radiating and circumferential centers, um, and potentially marking the edge of the mantle plume um, at the edge of the plume center, at the edge of the circumferential swarm. This is in a reconstruction uh, with the pieces of Franz Joseph Lennon Svalbard and Greenland all rotated moved back to their positions at 130 to 80 million years ago. The number of circumferential swarms at present on Earth is only about 15 or so, but we just started recognizing these a few years ago. And we think there's bound to be lots more to be found because on Venus, we think the analog of these circular things called corona, and there are hundreds of those things. And so we expect based on this matching of corona on Venus with circumferential dike swans on Earth, that there are uh, tons yet to be discovered. Here's another example. This is the, um, the radiating swarm associated with the Siberian trap event and a really clear circumferential set near the plume center here. Just to throw out a kind of a, a possible idea, the Keweenawan Large Igneous Province uh, uh, is of the Mid-Kana region is very enigmatic. It doesn't have a third rift arm and it's, and it's enigmatic. It has this very odd kind of horseshoe shaped here. And so we've proposed in a, in a book volume um, from published by Springer on dike swarms, lead uh, editor Rajesh Srivastava, that this is actually uh, has analogies, analogous to a coronas type structure with a circumferential dike swarm developed the plume center, not being in the middle of the rift, but south of it in the Goodman Swell. All right, I just now want to head into the last part of the talk here, which is looking at the uh, links with climate change. Uh, so the, there are the big, fee, big five major extinction events, the can, um, uh, um, and Cretaceous, Triassic, Jurassic, Permian, Triassic, Late Devonian, and Endor Division. And so these three, the top three here, are very convincingly located or linked with LIPS now although the Deccan also has, seems to have a, a, a additional uh, in, uh, help in causing the mass extinction with the Chukchalu meteorite impact. But the other two here, the age correlations are extremely tight, I'll show in a moment. We're also now finding wrong, strong evidence for the late Devonian mass extinction being linked to Yakutsbalui lip of Siberia, Siberian craton, the Kola Dnieper lip of uh, Baltica craton, and then we also are finding good magmatic support for uh, magmatic causes, lip causes for the end or division early Silurian event. So in terms of mass extinctions, this is a diagram from White and Saunders from years back, but it does show nicely the distribution of extinction level and the correlation with, um, um, with lips, both associated with Siberian trap event and the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province. More recently, uh, Jennifer Kasbaum in our, this AGU geophysical monograph that I mentioned before, looked at a number of lips, looked at the offset in age between the, um, uh, the extinction event and the, or the, uh, the environmental event as in uh, uh, um, ocean and oxy event uh, and the lip event. So you can see really remarkable correlations. The camp event tied in nicely with the end Triassic extinction, the Siberian trap event. Uh, tied in nicely with the end Permian. The Emishan seems to be close, though perhaps slightly younger, uh, and so on. So um, the geochronology that's being available now is certainly tying up, tightening things up. The skier guard intrusion, which represents the second pulse, part of the second pulse of this North Atlantic Igneous province, is right on the, the PETM, this um, 
paleocene um, thermal maximum. So the correlation with the impressive geochronology is certainly tightening up the link. Here's the sp specific with the Blair Shona paper where you've got precise dates that are, this is only about a million years from here to here. And you see re remarkable correlation and several pulses of lips and spracketing the, 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 the impact and also the mass extinction. So, um, okay, so now just mosey on here a little bit and just talk about the kinds of roles that lips can, how they can contribute to, to the mass extinctions. Uh, global warming, um, both the volcanic intrusive component, global cooling through weathering and CO2, CO2 drawdown or some sulfur dioxide being converted to aerosols. Uh, and an oceanic anoxia, acid rain, ocean acidification, release of toxic metals, mercury is particularly well correlated with lip events now with volcanics event in general, but also with lip events. And so um, one can see in sedimentary horizons, the, the concentration of mercury to total organic carbon um, that is the signature of a volcanic event and correlates with the timing of lip events. Sea level changes, depletion and bioessential elements and nutrients and the progressive oxygenation of the ocean and atmosphere. I draw your attention to this neat book that um, we uh, produced, uh, Alex, myself, Alex Dixon and Andre Becker were the editors and we had 21 amazing authors and chapters in this thing that provide a really neat overview of all aspects of LIPS as drivers of global and environment biotic change. And it is open source, so it's all free to download. Just a couple more things here. Uh, and this is now gonna be moving things into how it applies to the Precambrian record. Uh, so anoxia events, times of oceanic anoxia, there are a number of key times here that are well correlated with lip events. The Selly or the, the Selly uh, at 120 with time wise with Antang Java, oceanic lip, and then the Bonarelli at, at about 95, but there's actually some, some multiple pulses in here, potentially the Columbia River lip, the Madagascar, the high Arctic, and so on. Let's move back in time. Paper by Xuanhang Zhang was looking at the, um, correlation between this impressive set of 1380 large igneous provinces and also black shales and noting a really remarkable kind of matching 1382, 1384 um, between timings of black shales and lips. So there's a, there seems to be a potential causative effect there. The paper in geology discusses it in more detail and I'm just going to mention it for the moment. And also the mention and kind of anticipate this idea of using lips to mark, um, to represent natural boundaries. If this is a, if, 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 this, if this correlation between these black shales and the 1380 lips holds, well, it seems to hold, then um, it would be suggesting a fairly significant um, environmental change at 1380. And that's close in time to this, this definition between the Kalminian and the Ecstasian boundary. And so maybe the natural timing for this boundary, the natural age would be 1383. So this is towards this particular example of using the lip record as a proxy for defining uh, a net more natural Precambrian time boundaries. More about that in a few moments here. This same sort of correlation between lips and black shales occurs at other times. Um, again, this is in, and this is in a chapter in the new, that new AGU book. So you can see more details here at 1380 here at 1320. 1270 here at um, 1110 or so. So there's a number of, um, there's more work to be done in terms of testing out this black shale versus lips correlation throughout this uh, uh, 1800 to. Uh, now um, I'm cognizant of the time here. We're doing okay here. So let's keep them rolling along here. One of the other things is there's obviously, you know, as, I, as we're all familiar with this, this, um, stepwise increase in oxygenation of the of, of the earth um, in the Paleoproterozoic again in Neoproterozoic, and that also is quite interestingly associated with glaciations. And so I wanted to take this as a moment to kind of look at the kind of the matching between lips and glaciations, glaciations and lips, and also silicic large igneous provinces. And if you look at a time, and this is kind of this. this this is sort of a, a, a kind of rough correlation, some more details in a moment. But uh, one could think of uh, a lip starting a uh, glaciation through 
intense uh, weathering and CO2 drawdown or for the sulfur dioxide effect I mentioned before. Uh, and then you can also imagine that a pulse of mafic lip magnetism could end the silicic uh, or end the glaciation. So here are a number of different examples in the Phanerozoic here, the Hernandian, and then here are some of the Precambrian ones. And so I'm just going to, the next slide is going to focus more on the Precambrian ones. And the first I'll mention is the gaseous glaciation, and the which is a very short-lived glaciation. And to mention a paper by Nasser Yubi in 2020, 2020 it should say in uh, GSA special volume. And it looks at the, um, the timing of the gaseous glaciation and also pulses of the central Iapetus magmatic province, which has a significant pulse, multiple pulses over about 60, 70 million years, but there's a discrete pulse around 580 or so. And a potentially key driver in the gaseous glaciation is in the northern Morocco, the Wazirzad group, which has both a felsic pulse, which one can imagine starting or contributing to the start of the glaciation, and then a mafic pulse a mafic flood basalt sequence that could be correlated with the end of it. So that might be part of, that might help us understand this coupled felsic followed by mafic pulses in a, in a, in a single Wasserzot lip being both uh, being responsible for helping us tip into the gaseous glaciation and then fairly quickly come out of it. Well, the one that's probably the strongest correlation and um, McDonald and others and Cox and others have been writing about the specific correlation of some of the 720 million year old lips with the start of the Sturkian glaciation. Specifically, they were interested in the Franklin large igneous province that I mentioned before, its timing and being right exactly at the start of the Sturkian. We also know that the Siberia um, portion, Siberia contains a portion of the same age. And then also we know that between East Antarctica and um, and Zimbabwe, there's also 720 magnetism. So it, it's not just the effect of the, the Franklin and the Irkutsk, but also, the, and also potentially in Baltica. So that's an evolving story, um, but the correlation with the start of the Sturkin glaciation seems, seems strong. So um, this is Paleoproterozoic glaciations. Um, a number of lip events here. This is from the Gumsley et al. paper in 2017 in PNAS, and you can see, um, a correlation with uh, some of these lip events approximately with the glaciations. There, there needs to be more precise dating on these glaciations and on these lip events to fully test out that kind of story. But uh, there's a taste of a correlation there then between um, the glaciations uh, and, the, um, and these lip events. So just in the last few minutes on this part of it, I just want to take a quick excursion using the database that um, I was showing before. Well, first of all, the Loma Bunny Jatuli, really impressive carbon isotope excursion. Uh, it seems it's here and it ends at around 2060, maybe, um, maybe 2100. There's some uncertainty in that. If it ends at 2060, then one could think the Bushfell lift, yes, and also the equivalent Kavitsa uh, and units in, um, Baltica are the same age, and then there's also this China, North China Craton unit of the same, same age. So they could be all tied in then with the, the end Ryacin and the, the end of the Loma Gundi to Thule carbon isotope excursion. If the carbon isotope excursion ends at 12, 2100, then all of these different events on these different blocks could be contributing to it. This is certainly a huge event because it's on so many different blocks. So uh, just this last thing, and that is to say, lips is natural time boundaries in the Precambrian. So as shown in the Phanerozoic, lips are associated with a majority of major boundaries because of their environmental effect. So lips have a regional effect, but have a global environmental effect, a regional magmatic effect, but global environmental effect. So while lips are not golden spikes in themselves, they are proxies for golden spikes. And so I just, in the next slide, I wanna show that many of the key approximate boundaries are close in age to major lips. So this is just a summary. So start of the cryogenian, the Franklin lip and others, the Xassian, the 1385 lips, Calminium, the Galler range lip, or, or Assyrian, the Bushveld, et cetera, and start of Sidarian, uh, Mystacity lip and others. And I just want to bulk, bulk that with just a few more specific slides here extracted from the, the AGU book that I mentioned before. Uh, at the end Fortunian, uh, Wichita and this event in Amazonia, the Gaskier's glaciation, in addition to the Wazerzad and what I mentioned before, there are also all these other potential units that are linked. And Ecstasian, 
these events and staff, uh, staff Arian, Gawler Range, et cetera. Antonian for the Sturtean Glaciation is here. Uh, and Kalaminian, these are all lip events that are potentially associated with that. Uh, and or, or, or Syrian, um, many different lips associated with that. So it's just, uh, it's really quite a bountiful lip record here. The end of the Sidereian at 2300, the Tybalkovsky um, event, end Archean, here's some lips potentially correlated to that. The end Mesio Archean, here's some lips that are quite close and potentially correlated uh, with that. In the last couple of minutes, I just want to do a slightly um, go out of this world a little bit and just um, um, uh, go out of this world. Go to Venus. Venus, same size, in many ways, similar internal structure to the Earth, but currently has surface temperatures of 450 degrees Celsius, 96% CO2. The atmosphere is 90 times as dense as that as Earth, of Earth and absence of plate tectonics. However, some recent modeling has suggested that Earth or Venus had an Earth-like climate for much of its history. And so what are the causes, potentially including oceans and plate tectonics? What is the, uh, the cause of the, of the global warming that changed it from Earth-like to the present totally uninhabitable? Uh, maybe it's massive, maybe increase in solar luminosity. That's part of the story, perhaps. Solar luminosity increasing 70% um, um, since then, since uh, over the over uh, solar system history, but also massive basaltic volcanism. And so in that regard, um, we're wondering, did catastrophic volcanism and CO2 re release about 700 million years ago, linked to extreme global warming, cause a runaway global greenhouse effect that evaporated Venus's oceans and turned it into the hot place it is now. That timing would mark the boundary between these ancient tessera terrain for which uh, we've, we've got some provincial evidence of fluvial erosion textures to the intense volcanism. So we're trying to find this transition to see if it is, it is linked to volcanism. The idea from a paper by Way, Mike Way and Del, Del, Del Genio suggested then uh, temperate conditions for much of Venus's history and then suddenly going warm. Uh, they've talked about, uh, literature talks about uh, global resurfacing on Venus, uh, and maybe that's true, although we can see uh, when we're mapping in detail, we can see uh, more complex history of volcanism on Venus, not simple short duration kind of global resurfacing. Uh, but, and so Venus is also been history, volcanic history consistent with more steady state resurfacing. We consider the possibility that the transition is caused by a simultaneous lips occurring in an Earth-like record. So if you think the effect of the Siberian trap event where 90% of life was worked out, wiped out. We had about a 10 to 15 degree temperature increase on top of background. If we had randomly several Siberian trap events occurring essentially at the same time, their uh, environmental effects could be superimposed and maybe we end up with a 60 degree temperature increase and maybe that's sufficient for a runaway. So heat death of Venus and Earth-like planets, it's a paper that um, we're working on. Simultaneous lips may yield mass extinctions, drastic climate change, and a runaway greenhouse on Earth and Venus-like worlds. The hypothesis is that the Venus rate of lip magmatism was comparable to the Earth, and uh, Earth's lips occur approximately randomly and uniformly over time at an average rate of about one to 15 million, one every 15 million years. On average, then simultaneous lip pairs and triples are expected over we did the modeling over 2,800 million years, which is where our terrestrial record was strongest, yielding env enhanced environmental impacts. And we're doing modeling underway to estimate the specific background conditions for multiple lip events leading to a runaway greenhouse um, effect. So if such a lip model could explain Venus's great climate transition, then could a runaway greenhouse effect be in Earth's future? So this is the final slide here. And just to say, um, if both Venus and Earth started off as Earth-like planets, Earth continued to its present day with a barcode record that, you know, has events every 15 million years, but doesn't seem to have any that are superimposed exactly, or many that are superimposed exactly. Where assuming a similar record for Venus, which is probably reasonable given the, the similar size and structure of Venus and uh, 
uh, and consistent with what our, our mapping is showing about the similarities between the lip record on Venus and that on Earth, then um, could, could a random pulse on Earth in Earth's future, a uh, random pulse of superposition of Siberian trap scale lips occur, cause a runaway greenhouse effect that changes um, Earth to Venus like? Could this happen tens to hundreds of millions of years in our future? Thank you very much uh, for for giving me this opportunity to give you a tour of some, of some of the things that I think are most exciting about the LIPS record, not only on Earth, but on Venus, and also with respect to ore deposits, and particularly with respect to the and continental breakup, but also with respect to um, environmental uh, and climate change. Thank you. Great job. Thank you, Richard. Um, you have you already have a bunch of uh, questions in the chat. So I'm going to go okay. ahead and start uh, delivering those to you. First one is from Jean Bedard. It says, great stuff. When you showed the giant circum uh, circumferential swarm of the Blake River, Blake River group, I'm guessing, Blake, Blake River GP. Our uh, when you showed the giant circumferential swarm. You want me to Blake ask it, Alex? Go ahead. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to know if if you were attributing uh, what you call the Blake River Group uh, circumferential swarm to what they called the the mega caldera a few years ago. Um, we were, yeah, we were aware of that kind of interpretation, and um, um, you know, there's a spectrum of circumferential features on Venus. So I'm mm -hmm. expecting that as we understand the Venus stuff, because we also have mega mega calderas on Venus that were recognized associated with some of the um, uh, corona uh, webs. Uh, we just had a paper in Earth Science Reviews by my student and we've got, we looked at their seat of corona and that's about 180 kilometers across and it, can, it has about a uh, kilometer of sort of sag collapse in the center. And so, uh, and does it have, now we don't actually have a circumferential swarm we have circumferential fractures, so there, some of those are probably dikes as well. So, so my comment was much more micro scale. It's just that Blake River Group mega caldera has been disproven by multiple people, so yeah. it, it should just be eliminated from from discussion completely. All right, I, I am. Um, you know what? What's important is that's fine because that, that, I'm. Um, we're interested in seeing the, the, the natural spectrum of sizes of circumferential systems on Venus and then or on Earth, you know, and from the ones that are up to 1700 kilometers across to the ones that are much smaller, uh, like this Blake River thing. And so, and then to oh, try it, and it's use It's just ours. a complete canard. It's not correct. Like they were correlating so-called pyroclastics that are different ages, most of which are not pyroclastic. <laughs> And the oval form of the thing has been through two subsequent deformation events. So there's no way that okay. form is, is primary. It's just, it's nonsense. Okay, well, thanks for that. Thanks for that. But great stuff overall. I believe most of your story. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, Paul was lined up up next to talk about climate sensitivity. Uh, go ahead, yeah. um, so climate sensitivity, um, is related to, it, 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 it scales with a doubling of CO2, okay? And so that means that in the distant past, when atmospheric CO2 was 10 or even 100 times what it is today because of the dimmer sun, right. a lip event would have to be 10 or 100 times larger to have the same climatic effect, okay? okay. So on the assumption that CO2 has been declining over time, Right. We would expect that the climatic consequences of LIPS, as far as CO2 is concerned, maybe not as far as other things, but for CO2, they should have less, they'd be less and less important as you go back in time geologically, but more and more important as you go forward in time towards the moist greenhouse, the Venus runaway, when CO2 in the atmosphere would be almost zero. Right. Okay. But my concern is, uh, that we'd be careful here and not overplay uh, the climatic consequences through CO2 of lips in the Precambrian, when CO2, right. on the assumption that CO2, atmospheric CO2 was very high. Well, I think that's got a lot, yeah, I and mean, things like the Siberian Trap have certainly 
have, you know, when you look at these young events, they That's certainly fine. have had sure. a significant. No problem. Theater, right. I think the correlation is very clear. Right. And, but, the, um, but extending that, using that as an analogy for the Precambrian, I think is, is fundamentally, there's a problem because of the CO2 climate sensitivity. Well, I'm looking forward to, what I'm looking forward to is getting the same kind of precision we get on the Siberian Trap event and the Dikan and some of these other events and the camp event that are so precise that we can look, we can look in the associated sedimentary sequence at the same time and, and see what kind of environmental change. Well, that's been done. It. I mean, Meishan and the initial eruptions of 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 uh, uh, of, of, the, uh, of um, Siberian traps. They're you know. Well, that part's out. What I'm saying is, yeah, I want to build on that. I want to build on that going back in time. You know, we have um, events dozen events that are equal in scale to the Siberian Chap event back okay, through time. We so see them as huge The target should be the Franklin Lip because the Franklin Lip, the Geochron, frankly, is terrible. That's right. No, we I agree. I agree over, that we need- Over more, we need, almost 15 million years. And so need, to really make the case that it's, that it's a causal relationship with the Sturdian and whether it's through weathering or through um, albedo in the by stratospheric aerosol, it's it's absolutely critical that the Frank. Well, I agree. That I mean, this is I, I see this as as driving the need, driving the energy towards second generation dating of these events to try and you know produce the same kind of now, precision. The whole badly I the whole uranium lead badly I dating thing. Uh, this is badly in need of reanalysis. I think it is, and and I you know we um you know we work with people like Sandra Camo and and others who are really you know really skilled with 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 um the highest precision kind of using zircon. So, you know, in our industry consortium project, the Bedelliite dating, dating was, or Badliite dating was really valuable when we were doing reconnaissance studies, getting the first ages on an event in an area, because then we would know it's a Badliite age. It's not, um, it's not inherited. It's not metamorphic. We know we get the magmatic age. Right. And so that was, gave us a lot of insurance, but it's quite clear that we need to do second generation sort of high precision, um, you know, chemical abrasion, Tim's dating to, to, to figure out, um, to get the high precision on the 1750 event, on the, you know, 1590 event, on the, you know, on and on event. I mean, 2100 event. Some of these events, though, actually do, there's, there's, there's really no possibility at this point that they're going to collapse to a, a uh, Siberian trap type scale. The Kiwanawan, you know, that's going to be 20 million years, however we cut it, you know, but yeah. will there be discrete pulses within that? that we can correlate with, with environmental changes. So I, I'm excited, I recognize, you know, I'm excited about the potential and, yeah. and bring on the uranium lead dating at the highest precision. That's been one of the, the, the huge benefits of having this industry support is they've enabled us, they've funded us for, you know, several hundred almost uranium lead dates. And so, uh, you know, uh, and so those have been essential to get Sandra to where we're at now. an excellent person to go to. She's uh, She's really, yeah. she's really good. You know, we have old sort of, we have uh, Kevin Chamberlain and we have, and Mike Wingate's been involved. And so we've got a, a broad international team. So yeah. um, couldn't be better. Yep. And Mike Hamilton for, as well from Toronto. And yeah. so, yeah, no, no, it's uh, great. All right. So we've got a couple of comments and questions from John Incarnation. Uh, he says, what lip is associated with the Australian East Antarctica breakup it says I was under the impression that that is an example of breakup without a large igneous province trigger. Can you just remind me of the time of breakup there? I I, I think I have an answer for you, but just give me the what's yeah, the time? Late, late Cretaceous, but it it only rifts a little bit for a long time and it sits there, and then it's not until the Cenozoic that it departs. And of course, it's under a cold spot. Remember, that's the, that's the thinnest oceanic lithosphere in the world and the deepest mid-ocean ridge is, is, is the part of the mid-ocean ridge segment between Australia and Antarctica. And, uh, and, and Mike Gurness thinks that that's because there's a Mesozoic slab that's sitting underneath. And so you have unusually cold mantle there. Um, okay. I, um... That's it called the, uh, the Australia Antarctica Discordance, I think it's called, but it's really a low spot on the mid ocean ridge. Um, the lowest. So, that, in terms of, um, so late Cretaceous, huh? Yeah. Yeah. 
but it, I don't it, remember whether we got like any a lot of, like a lot of ocean basins it rifts and it just sits there for some tens of millions of years South Atlantic is the same and then suddenly for some reason some people think that you finally up well enough mantle that you start to get the ridge push force and then the thing separates and, and diverges rapidly so it's I would very say tricky, I, the relationship between the lips and the breakup and the onset of a major seafloor spreading. Yeah, just one, you know, but, but one of the things I, I don't know, I don't think I have anything to add to what you said about the, the particular Australia, Southern Australia, Antarctica breakup there. But um, one of the things we have been finding is that we, we are finding additional events that suddenly give us, you know, find a, an unexpected correlation. So for instance, in Northwest Australia, um, there's 150 sort of um, magmatism uh, and we've got sort of um, um, multiple intrusions, a bit of a radiating dike swarm. It's a hint to this, this 150, 140 million year old kind of lip event that's not been well characterized along that portion. Be how careful, it fits don't find too many of them. Then, and then the whole causation argument goes out the window if they're happening all the time. Well, they are, though. That, I mean, the record is, <laughs> the I'll give you the correlation record. Then, <laughs> well, the, well, there's a lot of them. We can see it on <laughs> Venus, right? Venus has no plate tectonics at present. Yeah. But, you know, you saw the population of, of, of honest to God, real radiating dike swarms there, radiating gravid systems that we interpret as dike swarms. So I... I'll let I'll see what I'll see what we find. You know, if we yeah. if, if we don't find anything, so be it. Well, it's a good but, policy. <laughs> yeah, that's a great policy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there's a follow-up. <laughs> that's the hard part, believing it. <laughs> oh well, yeah, well, you know, I I mean, uh, yes, uh, but we'll see. You know, we're, we're acting. You know, we're, what we're doing is we're hungrily trying to you know, get samples sent from our colleagues around the world on units and get them dated and get the dike swarms dated. And, and so um, we're not, you know, we're not sitting on our laurels or on our wishes. We are hungrily trying to get new data to see what, see what, see what events we find, right? You're as hungry now as you were 35 years ago. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> you got me. I told you this before, but you got me on Venus actually because we were sitting in the halls of the GSC one evening, and the Magellan data from Venus had just come out. And Paul, Paul said, "You know, I think th these things look like dike swarms." And I, I, so that got me started on Venus. So thank you, Paul. <laughs> I have no recollection of this. <laughs> oh, that's okay. I, it was, it was a. <laughs> it sounds in character, though. There you go. Yeah, I know. All right, let's move along with more questions. Uh, right. A follow-up from John says, could you briefly explain the reason for the circumferential dike swarm? The radial swarms are understandable from a push from below stress, but I don't quite get how the circumferential swarm stress uh, state forms. Um, yeah, well, the um, there is some modeling that suggests what you can, and um, um, there's some there's some papers including a recent paper by um, uh, Friedrich and Bunge, uh, 2018, that's looking at the dynamics above a mantle plume. Mantle plume comes up, and as the plume is coming up, it's causing a domal uplift. The domal uplift narrows and gets higher as the plume gets closer to the surface. So at some point, the radiating fractures develop, and when the plume gets close enough, they're filled with a radiating dike swarm. Then the plume reaching the lithosphere starts to spread out, and, and as it's spreading out, uh, there seems to be, a, from modeling anyway, a tendency for the center to collapse a bit and you develop sort of hoop stresses. And one of, so we think they're associated with the spreading stage of, uh, of the mantle plume beneath the lithosphere. One of the questions we don't know yet though is some of these circumferential swarms can be quite wide. They can be 100 or 200 kilometers wide. So it's not just at a particular point. So we've wondered, and one of the things we wanna do on earth is to try and figure out the timing of the inner versus outer. Is, is what's happening that the circumferential systems are developing as the, um, <laughs> I'll be there in a second, Paul. Well, uh, as, a, as, the, um, uh, as the plume is spreading. So, you know, so we're, are we tracking the, the history of, here's the plume edge at this point, at this point, at this point. So are we tracking it? That part we don't understand, but we think it's in the larger ones are linked to the spreading of the mantle plume. There is a wrinkle that in some cases, both on Venus and Earth, it, the, this idea of the radiating swarm preceding the circumferential swarm is not always followed. That sometimes you have 
what seemed to be more than one cycle of radiating and linear and circumferential and then radiating again. So that part we, we haven't um, sorted out yet either. That's what I know, we know at this point. But we have the advantage of using both Venus and Earth to, to try and help us understand that. So it's, uh, I think. All right, next lined up is uh, Vladi. So Vladi's question, Vladi kind of has three questions. He says, so what are you suggesting, Richard? Lips follow glaciations or do they cause glaciations? Black shales certainly follow oceanic lips. And that's with a question mark. Uh, one should differentiate between uh, consequences and triggers. Yeah. Um, well, there's complex things with respect to black shales. Um, the, you can have them, uh, they do seem to be time-wise associated with oceanic lips. They can also be associated presumably with um, kind of a nutrient flux from the continents as you uh, as you produce a lip, you, you erode a, lot, uh, a large amount of material quickly, release a, carry a lot of phosphorus and other nutrients into the, you know, into the shallow oceanic realm and then get a burst of biologic activity. And then, you know, it, it uses up the available oxygen, oxygen, that sort of thing. Um, so I think that makes sense mostly. I, I know one of the things is, um, the relationships are complex, right? So I, I'm not, I don't want to, I'm still in a, I'm still a student of all this stuff and trying to understand all of the ramifications, but with respect yeah, to glaciations, um, <clears throat> you know, if you've got um, the weathering drawdown, then again, the lips would, the glaciation would follow. If you've got weathering, if the, if the, if the cooling is due to weathering and CO2 drawdown, then if there should be a slight lag between the arrival of the lip, it's weathering, and then the CO2 drawdown, and probably the same for the sulfur um, sulfur dioxide that converts into sulfur aerosols. That would also mean a lift yes. preceding. Richard, I, I understand all that. That's the, you know. So what I wanted to to make clear is that one one should expect if if you want to connect things, mm -hmm. one should expect a logical. Uh, mm -hmm. row of events, right? Mm -hmm. One causes the other and not vice, uh, not vice versa. Right, right, uh, right. And that needs to be found out and discussed. Yes. So, you know, it would be logical to have uh, magmatism and uh, sea level rise and increase of oceanic volumes and therefore more black shales perhaps. And it would be maybe logical to have uh, climatic changes after large volcanic events and then expect maybe a glaciation. But with the glaciation, it's not the case, you know? So especially the one you have mentioned, the Proterozoic glaciations, lower Proterozoic glaciations, there is a whole event, uh, row of events at that time between 240 and two, uh, uh, 2440 and so on, right? right. And so, so you have, you, you know, sometimes the volcanics are on top of the glaciers, sometimes the volcanics are below the glaciers. Uh, and throwing everything together uh, just complicates things. I, I, I don't think it, 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 it uh, produces a clearer picture you know, on the opposite. Well, I think that's, it's, this is a starting point. I mean, that, that kind of correlation is a starting point, but then we need you know, the stratigraphic kind of relations you're sure talking about and the geochronology that Paul was talking about, the high precision geochronology. I mean, I, I take this as a starting point. I certainly don't think that, I mean, I love lips, but I don't think they're the, they're, they're not the whole story, but they're, they're a perturbance that's significant. <laughs> and um, we want that we need the geochronology. We need the additional data to test it, to test the specific relationship. You're, you're always going to have volcanism, a burst of volcanism associated with deglaciation because of the decompression. I mean, you see that at the end of the Pleistocene. Which so these mean? events like LIP, they have comp they have complex uh, consequences. Mm -hmm. So it's not inconceivable in theory that uh, a LIP could both cause a glaciation and terminate it. I'm not saying there's yeah. a good argument that for either, but but in principle, there's no reason because these are comp these have these are these, these uh, events have have complicated effects. Just one, yeah, one, just building on that, just, you know, yeah, because there can be, you know, we, we, we 
there can be precursor magnetism as well, right? There can be alkaline magnetism or carbon mag or kimberlite magnetism or just, you know, alkaline magnetism preceding the main lip events. So you may have situations where some magma comes out, it's not sufficient to affect the climate. And then you have the main pulse that comes out and does, right? So there's, there's commonly, right? Or, or vice versa. You can have later pulses that have nothing mention, to do with the event. Yeah, we should mention the, uh, the McDonald uh, uh, Wood, Woodward idea uh, that when you have a lip on the equator in a cold climate, so the tropopause isn't too high, uh, then thermal plumes can loft uh, sulfate aerosol into the stratosphere. They only last for a few months, but they have a very strong albedo effect, particularly at low latitude. And the cooling is very fast and, and therefore it, it's able uh, to overcome the silicate weathering feedback. Do you see anything to get to, to, to overcome that uh, stabilizing feedback? It, it works best if you have a cause that's, that's short lived, that's rapid. That's the problem with using lips for weathering. Sure, they make the climate colder, but you can, it's hard to make them, get them to make a snowball because the silicate weathering feedback just cools everything down. And so reduces the weathering rate. Yeah, um, yeah, I'll, I'll give that to you, Peter. Yeah, yeah um, so your your view is that the, that the weathering is not the strong uh, factor for for lips. That's it, it, well, a sulfur dioxide. It can help because it, it's all it's easier to make a snowball when the climate's already cold. Well, that's the thing is, yeah, where, you know, the, and so, also it, because yeah. these are rare events, uh, it's easier to understand them if you have two causes that happen to coincide or you have a lip that's not just a normal lip, but it's on the equator and it's erupted through very sulfur rich uh, bedrock. And so the aerosol is unusually uh, sulfur rich. Jean Bedard showed that to be true for, uh, for, for the Natkusiak and the, and, the, and the Franklin Sills that they're unusually sulfur rich, if I'm not mistaken. And so that is a contributing factor to why that particular lip was so potent. Already yeah, of course, equatorial location, sulfur rich aerosol. And yeah. so that this, this coincidence of causes helped to explain rare events. Yeah. Because lips and you know, there should have been snowballs, you know, every 15 million years otherwise. Well, it's, a, it's the same issue we've got, say, with uh, the metal potential, the magnetic sulfide potential. We've got many lips of the same size as Norils, but which of those are, you know, I mean, there are many candidates but which do we recommend to the companies, right? What kind of criteria to say, well, it's not just volume, what is it? And so there's a, I just maybe mentioned that there's a paper that uh, Julian Pierce was led on, um, a lip printing paper that just got published in Lithos. And it's a new diagram for plotting and characterizing lip geochemistry. And it does kind of uh, show quite clearly that there are some that have no, um, have more of to oib kind of prior chemistry. And there are other ones that have significant interaction with say metasomatized lithosphere. And it's those that have metasomatized lithosphere that in some cases are the ones that are, uh, or potentially crustal contamination that are kind of evident on this diagram are the ones that are known to be, seem to have more potential. So we're kind of early stages in that, but that's one of the things that's exciting is to start to use say in the case of using geochemistry on all on on lip events, many of which are huge, to figure out which of, which have more potential for on inherently for ore deposits, and the same kind of thing with respect to climatic effects. We really need to understand what the ambient, both what the chemical characteristics, sulfur concentration, say, and the thing, the paleo latitude of the of the plume or lip event, and then the ambient conditions, just, you know, at the time to really you know figure out why some would have an effect and others don't. So, I agree with stuff. you about metallogeny, and this is why metallogeny is almost unapproachable by science, because so much of it is due to chance and coincidence. Yeah, well, but, but if, you, if you hit it right, you know, the companies hit it right, um, it, it's worth it, it, right? Exploration <laughs> geophysics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, they're hoping. They're hoping the companies that are sponsoring us are certainly hoping that we give them something that increases the chances of. It. I mean, they should be paying. They should be using that money for remediation. But uh, next best okay. is science. All right. So we've got another question from Spencer Zegler. You mentioned that you could briefly touch on the pros and cons of the mantle plume hypothesis 
and some other possible causes of lips. If there is time, I'd love to hear your summary. Sure, Spencer. Uh, um, well, we've been working at I've been working at Dyke Swarms forever, and and so working in the Canadian Shield, we saw these magnificent radiating dike swarms, and then realized that you know where you could have the, the Franklin swarm or the Mackenzie swarm, the Franklin swarm going out, you know, potentially thousands of kilometers radiating from a center. Boy, that that looked to us pretty strong evidence for a central magma mantle plume kind of role, not any kind of plate boundary sort of role. So that's where we came from and where we got into um, myself and particularly worked with Ken Buchan and other people um, got into then thinking about realizing that these were the plumbing system of lips. So to the degree that we're continuing to find giant radiating swarms, that's a key, that seems to me still key support for these being plume related. But there's certainly tons of other stuff going on. Uh, certainly in many cases, you've got two pulse sort of things where you have, say, with the North Atlantic Igneous Province, you have initial plume arrival at, say, 62 million. And then starting about four or five million years later, the onset of rifting and a decompression melting and a whole new lip pulse. And so certainly there are many cases where we can see more than one pulse of a lip and we can interpret that the first pulse is plume related and the second pulse is purely decompression melting above a thermal plume that's sort of White and McKenzie kind of story from 1989 and 1995. Other stuff, uh, delamination, crustal or lithospheric delamination is potential, but from the modeling I've seen, it's really not on its own sufficient to uh, produce a, a lip scale magnetism. Another thing that people talk a lot about, and particularly related to silicic magnetism, silicic provinces, but to some degree mafic as well, is back arc spreading from sort of rollback of the subduction zone. And people like um, Bill Collins and others are really big on this sort of thing. And we've had discussions about it, particularly with, and so I, I'm still trying to figure out from a, from a, from, from perspectives, whether the volume of, you know, can you get a million cubic kilometers of silicic magnetism in a back arc setting from normal back arc spreading processes? I, 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 that's a question that I'm, look forward to answering and seeing more of. Also, there are a lot of mafic, ultra mafic intrusive suites that companies are interested in that seem to, that could be in a back arc setting. And we're trying to get dating on those and dating of seeing whether they belong to more regional events and where they could simply represent a plume that's come up into a back arc setting and then produce, the, you know, so an area of thin crust and produce magma. Um, other kinds of things, so that kind of, so back arc spreading. The other kinds of things that people like uh, Jill Folge. <laughs> I see huh? VMS in your future. See what? VMS, volcanogenic mass of sulfide. Oh, okay, divide. VMS. Oh, yeah. yeah, well, <laughs> well, well, yeah we, uh, yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> but the, and then there's... Um, look uh, look up know. the old papers by Dan Kerrig on back arc spreading. They're usually associated with a big uh, silicic ignimbrite flare-up or submarine equivalents. Yeah, well, maybe they're sufficient. Okay, what's the what's the guy again? Who's the who's the Carrick. author? Carrick, Dan Carrick. Okay, okay, we'll do. Um, yeah, so we have to see whether it's the volumes matter, <laughs> the compositions matter, but yeah, um, and other things like people, Jill Folger and Don Anderson were certainly pushing for everything being upper mantle and no plume involvement whatsoever, and that you've got cracks in the ocean or fractures in the ocean, and those can somehow produce a large amount of magma, or you have somehow accumulate a large amount of magma below the crust by some process over a long period of time, and then it gets released quickly. There's a whole bunch of other things um, that we're aware of, but um, I still like the, based on the dike swarm stuff particularly, and for the hundred or so swarm events for which we see, um, you know, radiating swarm, um, I prefer a plume story to be the dominant thing with contributions from some of these other effects, but let's see what the data tells us. All right, so uh, Lyle Harris had a question and then Paul had some comments. So I'm gonna uh, get so Lyle awesome. in here and then see if you wanna chat more. Um, so Lyle, would you like to ask yourself, Lyle? Yeah, okay. No, uh, well, Richard, you've certainly covered a lot of material, but you just mentioned very briefly the silicious uh, igneous provinces. I'm just wondering just how common are slips and uh, 
the tectonic implications and modes of formation. And a little bit on that same topic, you also had a slide uh, related to mineralization where you had Murantau uh, being yes. uh, related to a lip, whereas at Murantau, the volcanism, and in fact, the large uh, ring of uh, intrusions, uh, they're granites, uh, uh, not uh, mafic intrusions. So I'm just wondering if that is uh, an example that you might have uh, for a slip. Yeah, I, well, um, my my initial understanding of, of slips comes from the sort of initial work of Scott Bryan, right? He was the one who was advocating silicic large igneous provinces as just, you know, as an interplate sort of thing back in 2002, at least with a GSA volume that uh, who was, anyway, he was in that uh, back in 2002. And then since that time, um, you know, he's written a number of things related to Whit Sunday, which is off uh, Eastern Australia and um, uh, Sierra Madre Occidental of, um, near uh, Southwestern US and Mexico and some others. Um, I'm fascinated by those, and I don't have a, I don't have kind of a formal final sort of opinion, except that um, the sort of the, the A type stuff seems to be the the A type Silicic provinces, the Malani province of India, for instance, at 750. Um, that kind of thing, I think, has got to be plume related. You know, so many of these A type sequence AMCG suites. Um, work with uh, Leonid Shumlansky, who works in Ukraine and the Ukrainian shield and some of that magnetism. And so there's a lot of AMCG stuff there that is consistent and associated with tholitic magmas, so consistent with sort of a, a, a plume sort of story or a lip sort of story there. Um, Nigerian the younger granites. Sorry? Nigerian younger granites. Yeah, what age are those? Are those... Um, Nations. Are they 130? By chance? I, I don't know that they're well dated. Yeah, we're really interested in this because we're looking for a continuation of the, um, this is work with, or that started from uh, somebody in South America. There's a, there's a, she's published on the Equamp lip, right at the corner of uh, Brazil there. Um, in the corner, you've got um, 1300 kilometer long dike swarm, a major sill province. Uh, we're calling it the Equamp lip, 130 million years old. And we want to find its continuation into to uh, adjacent Africa. And so I've been trying to find information on units there. We've talk, been trying to find- Talk to Joe Whalen, uh, Richard, about, uh, about large silicic uh, magmatic provinces. Okay. Um, I will, but just, yeah, no, cause I'm aware of his work, but just with respect to the Murantau. So one of the things that's really important for is this, as you go back in time and the setting may not be clear, um, where you have a suite of granites that are post-orogenic, um, are they, um, you know, what's the setting? Is, it, is this a clue that there's a subduction setting, that there's a suture there somewhere? Or is this a clue to a silicic lip? Where this has come kind of relevant is with respect to Southern Siberia. Between Northern and Southern Siberia, there's talk of this boundary, the Akitkin belt representing a suture. Um, but um, it's, there are a bunch of granites there that are around 1870, 1860, 1870, 1860. And there's a huge dike swarm, um, 400 kilometers long and potentially extendable to 1,000 kilometers long, dolerite dikes that are 1860. And so an open question is whether these post anergenic or orogenic granites that I think are, I can't remember whether they're SRI type, um, are they part of a silicic province? You know, a plume melting lower crust, or are they, um, or, are, or, or in fact, you know, are, are, are some of our Russian colleagues correct that this, that this is evidence for their uh, a Kitkin suture? My, my thought at this point is there's not a suture and that these are silicic granites. So this is kind of important then trying to characterize and understand when are silicic granites, whether of a, you know, a or SRI type, part of a subduction setting or are they, or are they extensional interplate setting? And that's, you know, you either put a suture zone there or you don't, and that's pretty fundamental kind of decision. So that's why it's important for us to try and understand these better. With respect to Marantau, Marantau gold, um, the Turim lip is really um, extensive there, but there's also, of course, you know, a huge amount of strikes, uh, major shear zones through there. And my understanding was that the shearing, um, you know, is, uh, is much more specifically important to the Murantau gold occurrences, but the timing and the correlation of the thermal pulse from the Turim lip 
given the age correlation, suggests a, a correlation that um, the spe a specific kind of interaction that you know takes the the shearing the shear zones, the generated uh, caldera, I guess, uh, silicic systems. Whether the silicic systems are part of the terim, ter it's not something I've looked at yet. So, um, but uh, I'm intrigued now. Can, uh, what was the age of uh, that lip, please? Uh, the 290 to 270. It okay. actually has three sort of pulses. The There's of the granites. Huh? The granites are more about 294, 300, something like that. So, yeah. The, the kimberlites actually in this thing. There's kimberlites as well that start around 300. So for some reason, the kimberlites seem to be slightly older. The the and then the mafic magmatism comes in two pulses starting around 290 something. So that that would be coincident in time. But um, I can send you, you know, there's a, there's a number of excellent Chinese publications on it. So I can send you uh, one of those or some of those.